come. Let's pray. Jesus, as we take a few minutes now to open your word, would you come and open our minds and our hearts, I pray in your name. Amen. I want to talk a little bit this morning about amazing Jesus. Now, when I say amazing Jesus, <clears throat> I can say amazing Jesus. Like Jesus is amazing. That's an adjective, amazing. Or I can say amazing Jesus like something is amazing Jesus. He's getting amazed by something. So today we're not going to deal with the adjective amazing. We're going to deal with the verb amazing. What was amazing to Jesus? There's a word in the New Testament, um, thalmazo. <clears throat> it's the word for amazing or um, marveling. Almost kind of fits, you know. I was just really thalmazled, <laughs> you know. Uh, anyway, um, it's used about 33 times. 26 times people are marveling at Jesus' words and actions. For instance, uh, Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves, and the men marveled. They were amazed. Um, the paralytic is healed, and they're all amazed and marveled. Um, uh, Jesus casts out a demon, and the multitude marvels. They're amazed. Thalmazo. And... Jesus is talking to that Samaritan woman, and the disciples are amazed, okay? They marvel. Um, 26 uses there. Four times people are marveling at other things, like at Zacharias spending so long in the temple, or why he'd name his kid John and not after himself, or uh, the, sh the shepherds. It says they marveled at what the shepherds were telling them, like this angel choir and stuff, okay? And uh, Joseph and Mary marveled at Simeon's words concerning Jesus. But only three verses is Jesus marveling or amazed. And it's really only two stories. The story of the centurion servant being healed, two of those uses, and then the story of Jesus' last and final visit to Nazareth. What amazed Jesus? Very interesting. Let's go to the story of the, of the uh, centurion. Jesus entered Capernaum. A centurion came to him, pleading with him, Lord, my servant is lying ill at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. The centurion said, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Just speak the word. I'm a man under authority. I say, go, they go, come, they come, do, they do. And Jesus marveled. He said, surely I have found not such great faith, not even in Israel. Down to verse 13, go your way. As you have believed, let it be done for you. And the servant was healed that same hour. So what made Jesus marvel? That somebody actually believed. Now, you can go to the same story in the Gospel of Luke, and you get a little different twist. Matthew has the centurion coming to Jesus. Luke has the centurion sending a delegation to Jesus. Verse 3 there, he sent the elders of the Jews pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom, that, that the one for whom he should do this thing was deserving because he loves our nation and build us a synagogue. Notice they... The, it, it's interesting. Now, which is true? This is where some of the skeptics say, see, the Bible contradicts itself. It says Jesus, the man came to Jesus, then he said he didn't come to Jesus, he sent a delegation. Well, my guess is that Luke's is the more accurate because you wouldn't make that part of the story up. But if you're telling a story 40 years later, you might forget that detail. You just simply have a centurion who asked for his son to be healed and he got healed. Matthew forgot about the delegation. I don't know, that kind of discrepancy doesn't bother me because I don't think the inspiration of the scripture is for the mighty, tiny, minute detail. The inspiration of scripture is for the message. All right? But notice, the Jewish leaders are impressed with this man because of what he's done. He loves us and build our nation, build a synagogue. Now, this is weird because, remember, this guy is a centurion, which means he is a Roman soldier, leader of a hundred. He's part of the oppressors. He's part of the invading uh, 
oppressing rulership of the Romans that they hated, and yet he had endeared himself by what he did to the Jewish leaders. And they say, Jesus, you really ought to heal this guy's servant. He's worthy. He's built us a synagogue. He built us a church. Jesus went with them. And when he was already not far from the house, evidently the centurion heard that Jesus was on his way to the house. And he sent a second delegation saying, Lord, don't trouble yourself. I'm not worthy to have you enter under my roof. Just speak the word. I'm a man under authority. Go, they go, come, they come, do, they do. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. And now Jesus marveled. He, so notice, he not only marvels that the centurion trusts him, he marvels the centurion trusts him at a distance. <laughs> notice the religious leaders liked the guy because of what he had done. Jesus is amazed because of his Faith, trust, belief. That's a relational word, not a behavioral word. Jesus isn't amazed at the guy's deeds. He's amazed at the guy's faith. What does it take to amaze Jesus? Have you ever tried to amaze Jesus by doing lots of good things? You're never going to amaze him with your behavior. You're going to amaze him with your faith. Second story. Jesus' second and last visit to Nazareth during his ministry. Remember the first time he breezed into Nazareth, they asked him to read the scripture, and he read, it looks like he, you know, it's a very formal thing. They had a liturgy by then in the synagogue where you read a certain portion each Sabbath of one of the prophets and you read a certain portion of the books of Moses. So they asked Jesus to do the prophet reading and what it really looks like is they handed him the scroll which they would have unrolled to the proper portion but it looks like he moved it and found the place, Isaiah 61, that said, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor and said, at liberty those that are oppressed and so on. And then he announces this day this is fulfilled. Essentially he said, hometown folk, I am the fulfillment of the prophecy looking for the Messiah. And what did they do? What was their response? They tried to throw him over a cliff. Literally, they, they rustled him out of the synagogue, took him up the side of a mountain, we're gonna throw him over a cliff. Who does this hometown boy think he is? And it says Jesus just walked away, <laughs> greased. He just couldn't get hold. <laughs> Boom, he, he, just, he just slipped away. Now he comes back a second time. He went out from there, apparently Capernaum, and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished. That's a different word for marveling than the one we're looking at saying, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary? Brothers are James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. Aren't his sisters here with us? So evidently Jesus was part of a larger family. We do know that he was Mary's firstborn, <laughs> right? You know, it's interesting because church tradition says that the brothers and sisters must have been, well, the suggestion is that Joseph had a wife that had children that had died and then he buried Mary. And you understand what that's all about. Somebody holy enough to be the mother of Messiah certainly wouldn't be involved in sex. That's the medieval viewpoint. Really holy people are sexless. Really holy people are celibate. Really holy people don't do that. And I was even raised with the idea that these were probably older siblings from Joseph's first marriage. I have absolutely no problem with Mary having a whole slew of kids. Because it said Joseph didn't know her until 
she'd given birth. Well, that means he did. So Mary was sexually active as a wife and probably had children. Jesus had at least four brothers, and he had multiple sisters. That gives at least six other kids. And they were offended. The word there in the Greek is scandalized that this local hometown boy was teaching and doing mighty works. Now it says, Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. And he could not do, and he could do no mighty work there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. Let me tell you something. If just a few sick people got healed this morning in this church, we'd think it was Pentecost. I've always smiled at that. He, he is a slow day. There you go. Couldn't do, he could do no mighty works except he laid hands on a few and healed them. And he marveled, there's the word, because of their unbelief. I find it interesting. Jesus is going to marvel at you. But it's not going to be over what you do. It's going to be over whether you believe or you don't believe. You know, the interesting thing to contrast these two, the outsider, the, the foreigner, the pagan Roman centurion is the one about whom Jesus marvels over his belief. The unbeliever has the belief. And the insiders, the Jews, the people that are Jesus' own relatives and part of the chosen people and the chosen race of Israel, who should be the believers, he marvels at their unbelief. By the way, don't ever look at somebody and judge them based upon externals or apparently what you can see because God may be seeing exactly the opposite. They may be the out and you the in. They may be the in and you the out. God's doing amazing things out there. I hope he's doing amazing things in here. I'd like to be a church that amazes Jesus by our trust, not by our distrust. But it's interesting how the insiders were the outsiders and the outsider was the insider. So it's a very simple concept. Jesus is going to be amazed at you today. Will he be amazed at your belief or at your unbelief? So how do you work, how do you work up that amazing faith? that will amaze Jesus. This is kind of a little subset in my sermon titles. Active abiding. Remember what we say? You start by sitting at the feet of Jesus. And that's what will build trust, relationship, intimacy. And then when Jesus gets up and goes to work, if you want to keep abiding with Jesus, what do you have to do? Just follow him. You don't have to decide, well, I've been sitting here long enough. Now Jesus wants me to do something, so I better go do something for Jesus. No. You sit at Jesus' feet, and when he moves, you move. When he sits, you sit. When he goes, you go. When he comes, you come. When he does, you do. You just abide with him. And that builds the kind of faith that will actually be amazing to God. I would like my life today to amaze him in the things I trust him in. I'm never going to amaze him by my behavior. I'm only going to amaze him by my faith. And I'll only get that kind of faith by sitting at his feet day by day. So Jesus only marveled twice. And it was at belief or unbelief. 
And I would like to sit at his feet and invite you to day by day so that we can all not just have amazing grace, <laughs> but have amazing faith. I'd like Jesus to be amazed with me and you. Wouldn't you like that? Jesus said, man, I am so amazed. I'm marveling at you for your great faith. That he can speak and it will be done in your life if you trust him. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for amazing grace. Thank you also for amazing faith. Lord, may we never judge one another on each other's behavior, but may we encourage one another in our faith to sit at your feet daily and let you build in us the amazing faith that will even make you amazed. Lord, forgive us that we so often amaze you with our lack of faith and that we head out into our day without spending time at your feet thinking somehow we got this thing today and we amaze you with our lack of faith. May we spend the time to become intimate with you that our faith might be amazing. We pray in your name. Amen.